freeze, bitches! A while back, I took a look at the main entries in the House of the Dead franchise, an iconic railgun shooter series that's partially responsible for the rise in popularity with zombie games back in the 1990s, along with featuring some of the best voice acting of all time in the second game. This is the final battle! What the hell's going on in this city? But one thing that I missed talking about on that list though was House of the Dead Overkill. Originally released for the Nintendo Wii back in 2009, but then also ported to the PlayStation 3 in 2011 with the extended cut. Don't make me whoop your ass again, G-Man. Not to mention another version for the PC called Typing of the Dead, where instead of shooting zombies to death, you type them to death instead. And the whole thing almost feels educational. He's mind touching me. This version can actually be played with a mouse and controller, but there's something kind of disingenuous about playing a rail shooter without a proper gun controller. Run for your life! Unlike the other games in the series, which were mostly developed by Sega, Overkill was instead developed by Headstrong Games. And you don't also need to look much further than that first intro screen to tell that this is definitely going to be something a bit more unique. So I thought it'd be fun to go and take a look at this thing, considering all I've heard for the last few months is a bunch of people telling me just how good it is. Hey you, Rocket Cub, jump on. And after blazing through the whole thing in a single sitting, all I can say is, yeah, that were right. You have the right to remain fucking silent. Overkill isn't the best rail shooter I've ever played, but I'll be damned if it isn't one of the most entertaining. I laughed more playing this game alone than I've laughed at every video game I've played in the last 12 months. And it also just kind of made me upset that this thing doesn't have more recognition. <laughs> If you've played the other games in the series, you'll know that they're pretty dark and gruesome shooters. In fact, in Australia, they used to put black curtains around the arcade cabinets to protect us from the violent imagery. Yeah, too bad they couldn't protect us from poisonous spiders in an overpriced housing market. Thank you. The stories might have been outlandish and wacky, but the amount of blood and gore was definitely a detractor for those unfortunate kids who had parents who forbid them from playing violent video games. Overkill, on the other hand though, is about as far removed from a serious game as you could possibly get. That's my stage, bitch! And it's kinda like what'd happen if House of the Dead was directed by Quentin Tarantino. Okay. Well, what do you mean? I mean, it's gory, there's a lot of naughty words, and it has a scene involving navigation up the female reproductive system, which we'll get into a bit later. Freeze, bitches! <laughs> but its roots are still in cheesy, schlocky exploitation films from the 1970s and the 80s. The image is obscured by film grain and scratches, and the narration is deep-voiced and tongue-in-cheek, combined with a pretty damn hilarious soundtrack. Forced to degrade herself, night after night, for cheap thrills and a handful of dollar bills. Otherwise though, Overkill is just a pretty basic rail shooter. You aim with a controller and shoot at everything that comes towards you. Well, almost everything. Shit, I think that was a live one. What is cool about this one too though, is that you've actually got a bunch of weapons to choose from. You start off with a Magnum, but you can unlock a shotgun and an automatic shotgun. There's an SMG, an assault rifle, hand cannon, and eventually more powerful weapons like a goddamn minigun. You unlock these guns by earning points and racking up combos along with collecting cash. And upgrading these weapons actually makes a pretty big difference to the gameplay, decreasing reload times and recoil, along with increasing weapon damage, fire rate, and clip size. You've got grenades, slow motion power-ups, and there's civilians to rescue throughout the levels or not rescue. Tell me that was you screaming like a schoolgirl. They've just taken all of those aspects of the arcade shooters and put it into a three or four hour long so story mode. But you know what? It's kind of hard to talk about Overkill without just talking about it. No one can be truly told what Overkill is. You have to see it for yourself. In your own time. Oh yeah. It's kind of like when something crazy happens to you in real life and all you want to do is just run into your mates so you can tell them what happened. Yep, Overkill is the exact same thing. Ew, watch your hands. And if you're going to be upset that I'm going to be talking about a lot of the plot related elements for this thing, well then probably just stop watching right now. In fact, you know what? Go buy the game, play it, and then come right back. It won't take you all that long and I'll still be here, I promise. Never mind. So anyway, the whole story is a prequel to the first game, broken down into mini episodes, which are then presented like these kind of short films. The game opens up with returning champion Agent G getting punched in the face by a dude named Isaac Washington. A character who throughout the entire game is just dropping F-bombs every few seconds like they're going out of style. In fact, I think he might have to hold some kind of record for the most profanities in a video game. Make him mad and he'll rip your balls off. I'm gonna rip your motherfucking balls off. 
can't think of any other game that's got someone swearing so much, aside from maybe the 50 Cent game or Rogue Warrior. But Isaac just takes this to a whole nother level, and every few words is accentuated by profanity. So much of it so that I'm probably going to have to censor it for this video, so that YouTube doesn't age restrict it. Motherfuck! What does a brother have to do to pacify a bitch? The way he just throws these random insults at enemies during combat consistently kept me laughing throughout the entire game, and he really is one of the funniest characters out of any video game I think I've ever played. Not so fucking clever now, are you, bitch? Anyway, Isaac is a detective teaming up with Agent G from the AMS, and these two have got a real Murtaugh and Riggs kind of relationship. That is, if Murtaugh spent all of Lethal Weapon calling Riggs a motherfucker. Hey, that there is country western's finest. You As the game kicks off, Isaac and G are investigating the outbreak of mutants in Louisiana. Yeah, mutants, not zombies. In fact, the game makes a point of not using that term. This starts off with the two of them moving through a mansion owned by a dude named Papa Caesar, who looks a bit like Burt Reynolds from Boogie Nights. I guess these two guys are on the money though because the mansion is crawling with mutants. They're on the verandas, they're in the kitchen, the bedrooms, and they're bursting through every possible entrance. After they shoot a bunch of these things, they end up in the basement where they find Caesar holed up with wheelchair-bound Jasper guns. He gets super pissed off when Caesar makes a threatening remark about his sister. Nobody threatens Barla. So he jabs himself up with a syringe that turns him into crypto from Destroy All Humans. This serves as the first boss fight in the game, and believe me when I say that a floating, disabled scientist that throws things at you with levitation is going to be about the most sane thing we're going to be experiencing in this game. Gee, you see this shit? After shooting him a bunch of times with your pathetically unupgraded Magnum, poor Jasper goes down, and then Isaac and G head off to chase down Caesar. Mm, we'll take my car. At this point, we're introduced to Vala, Jasper's sister, who happens to be a badass stripper. She's obviously pretty pissed off that her brother's dead, so she goes off to find Caesar and get revenge. Vala is apparently based off a model named Vicky Blows, which is about the most porn star name a non-porn star could ever possibly have. And she looks about as good as you'd expect the female form to look here, considering it was created for the Nintendo Wii. If you're playing the Overkill Edition, you then get to play through one of the best levels in the game, set inside a strip club that's complete with zombie strippers. I'm sorry, mutant strippers. It also introduces Candy Striper, Jasper's girlfriend, or ex-girlfriend I guess, who, despite being as dumb as a box of rocks, seems to have a bit of a heart of gold and took a real liking to Jasper. Tell me something I don't know, girl. I also think the cinematics with these two characters is always really funny to watch. There's just something so genuine about their interactions, which really is at odds with all the other insane shit going on in this game. You know my spelling ain't so good. Your speaking isn't so hot either, honey. I actually looked up the voice actresses for both of these characters and they've literally done nothing else apart from these games. So unless their listed names are just pseudonyms to protect their identities and maybe their careers, really does seem like they actually cast random women to voice these characters. Definitely adds to the whole low budget grindhouse feeling the game's going for. Tell me something I don't know, girl. The whole point of this cinematic, though, outside of just showing us a fair bit of Vala and Candy's enormous tits, is to show both these girls teaming up to kick some ass, and this involves escaping this fine establishment. Outside of the club, you're then trying to find Vala's motorbike, but it turns out the key's being held in the basement of a nearby biker bar. After this, we get the boss for the second level, who's based off your mum. This boss reminded me a lot of some of the older ones from the other House of the Dead games, where it just kind of seemed like every one of those games always found a way to include a boss fight, where it had a bigger, tougher monster to beat with a little one that runs around like a goddamn nuisance. After this, we're back with Isaac and G with a level set in a hospital, and every good horror shooting game worth a grain of salt always has to have a hospital level, complete with mutant doctors and sexy mutant nurses. There's actually a pretty cool sequence in this level on a rooftop, where you see this chopper crash and explode. Not to mention, this also brings back those barrel-throwing assholes from the other games. The boss for this level, though, kinda sucked, and I didn't really have a fun time with it. Move aside, diaper shit. It's pretty much just the girl from The Ring, or The Grudge, whatever. It's one of those Japanese horror films where the woman walks around with wet hair all the time. This one's called The Screamer, and she's actually kind of tricky at first, with three separate attack patterns which can be hard to counter if you're using the wrong weapon like I was. 
I used the submachine gun for most of this level and honestly, that was a bit of a stuff up because the high rate of fire doesn't really offset how pathetic the damage is. And against this boss, I couldn't even stagger her before she managed to hit me. Move aside, diaper shit. It also highlights what I think is one of the most annoying elements to the entire game, which is how every single time you die, it takes away almost half of your points you've earned for the entire level. I just don't know why they didn't include a live system or even basic checkpoints. <laughs> Anyway, after this fight, Isaac and G get a call from Burt Reynolds where he basically just rubs it in their face that he's one step ahead. Fala shows up and gives them a lift on her motorbike and what follows I think is some of the funniest banter you're going to see in the whole game. What kind of name is that? The name I was born with, dipshit! Fala and Isaac are like oil and water with Agent G just kind of sitting awkwardly on the back of this motorbike listening to these two go at it. They then come across a dead body in the road, and despite having seen probably hundreds of dead bodies at this point, they decide to hop off the bike and look at it for some reason. This pisses Vala off and she leaves them stranded. So they do what most sensible people would do and head off into the nearby carnival. I mean, yeah, what could possibly go wrong? Boy, I don't understand half the shit that comes out of your mouth. Still though, this is everything you'd hope for in a level that's set in a carnival. The whole thing's really colourful, there's mutants running around in clown outfits, you go past one of those swinging pirate ship rides and eventually near the end of it, Isaac and G take a romantic trip on a ghost train. For some reason too, there's heaps of civilians at this carnival running around like idiots, and because they're kind of hard to distinguish from a distance, I accidentally shot a whole bunch of them. <laughs> Sick joke. I don't know if I'd call the boss for this level Quato from Total Recall or Crank from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I mean, either way, it's a big, huge, muscly asshole with a smaller, ugly looking asshole on his stomach. AMS agent, put your hands in the air. All of them. And you don't need to be a goddamn rocket scientist to know that the thing on the stomach's gonna be the weak spot. This is definitely one of the easiest boss fights in the game though, and this thing telegraphs its attack so blatantly that you actually really do feel like an idiot if you get hit. The cinematic after this is another gem, and can we just appreciate for a moment that G and Isaac are driving an ice cream truck called Captain Cream Pie. Yeah, that's what your mum used to call me. This whole scene has G and Isaac discussing the terms of when it becomes appropriate to make someone listen to the kind of music you're into. I mean, it's kind of nice that they're taking time out of their mutant killing schedule to discuss some of the more pressing issues. What the fuck? What the fuck? After this is another exclusive level with Candy and Vala teaming up again, this time heading to a slaughterhouse for some reason. It's kind of forgettable for the most part, but it does again have some pretty funny dialogue, and you get to see these creepy looking skinless zombies who kind of remind me of Frank from Hellraiser. The boss for this level though is complete AIDS, and I don't know whether or not it was the game or something wrong with my controller, but I couldn't shoot its weak spot to save my life, or in this case, Vala and Candies. And yeah, again, I love losing half of my score from a single death. <laughs> There's a bit of a disjointed scene here because it then goes back to Isaac and G in the cream pie mobile and somehow Vala has suddenly caught up and she's with Burt Reynolds. This bastard can't live! But it does set up one of the better levels in the game which happens to take place on a moving train. And if there's one thing that I like in my games, it's a train level. By this point too, I just saved up enough money to buy the auto shotgun, which really is the best weapon in the game, hands down. The only downside is that the reload time is pretty slow until you upgrade it. This level though does introduce one of the most annoying enemies in the game, which are these roided up assholes that grab onto you, and you have to do this quick time event to get them off. Hammer time! And I just find it annoying because it slows everything down to a crawl and ruins the pacing. Not to mention, it always seems to happen like three or four times in every level. After clearing out the carriages on what seems to be the longest goddamn train ever made, you come up against the boss, which is this giant creepy looking praying mantis thing, with its only weak spot being its eyes, which are about the size of tennis balls. Visually though, this is an awesome fight, and I've got a real soft spot for these kind of train levels, where you can see the background environment moving past seamlessly in real time. Despite this train moving at a bazillion miles an hour for the past 15 minutes, Vala's still somehow able to catch up to these guys in her motorbike. And in the midst of all this trash talking, Caesar comes out of literally nowhere, then takes her hostage and heads off to a nearby prison. You dickheads better come rescue me, okay? We'll find you, Varna! The fastest way to reach the prison is through the swamp and a bunch of trailer parks, so G and Isaac head off to catch up. And overall, this whole next level is kind of unremarkable. Looks about as good as you'd expect a Wii game to look that's set in a murky swamp at nighttime. There's just nothing that stands out all that much though, and it's pretty run of the mill. 
But this is a perfect example, I think, of the writing coming to the rescue during this bit here where Isaac and G have to play rock, paper, scissors to see who's gonna have to try and arrest this giant blob of flesh that's come out of the water to attack them. Anything you say can and fucking will. This was another boss though that I thought was a giant pain in the ass because it does that bullshit where the only way that you can damage it is if you shoot its weak spot enough times during a very short window of opportunity. And also it just mostly sits in this one place throughout the entire fight. But if you've ever wanted a boss fight where the boss throws its own shit at you, well this one's got you covered, literally. The final two episodes are broken up between two levels, you've got the prison and then this lab underneath it. And it might be a bit late to start introducing villains, but the game does just that, as Isaac and G run into some weirdo outside the prison named Clement, who takes a piss that looks like nuclear waste is coming out of him. This guy claims to be the warden of the prison, but I doubt he's even warden of his own sanity, because take one look at the face on this nutjob, and you really know he's not playing with a full deck of cards. I got told there was trouble at my prison. I came down, and here I am. They really ramp shit up for this level too. The enemy count for starters is a lot higher. There's guys with riot shields, more of those big guys that grab onto you, and a lot of tight corners where you can get easily ambushed. And you save a civilian at one point who might be one of the most ungrateful bitches in the entire game. Never thought I'd be happy to see a fucking cop. Now, if there was any semblance of normalcy left at this point, well, you can expect that to go out of the window because from here on in, things start to get pretty weird. So, in a scene that shocks absolutely no one, Clement turns out to be the bad guy and is also responsible for this whole mutant debacle in the first place. This whole plan is an attempt for him to take care of his elderly mother, who he has a downright disturbing relationship with. And you know what? I'm sure there's another your mum joke that I could make in there somewhere, but I also kind of feel like I've reached my quota at this point. Let me give you some context here, boys. He then kills Caesar kind of unceremoniously and takes off with Vala to the lab beneath the prison. What follows is my favourite boss fight in the entire game against these two huge juggernauts that look like something out of Killing Floor, with crossbow launchers on their arms. And I love it because this right here is some old fashioned old school House of the Dead style boss fights, as you duck and weave around the room to avoid these guys while shooting back and knocking out their projectiles. After they're gone, this brings us to the eponymous final episode, Overkill. It's really just a combination of everything you've seen so far, and if you haven't upgraded at least one of your weapons at this point, then I can't even imagine how you'd deal with the influx of enemies. All roads lead to Clement, but before Isaac and G can confront him, they run into Vala, or so it seems. Only Clement's gone ahead and transplanted his mother's brains into poor Vala's head. Say what? but like takeaway curry mixed with a hangover, her body rejects it and starts throwing up, falling into this conveniently placed vat of toxic waste. But I've seen enough Joker origin stories to know that's not gonna stop a damn thing, and sure enough, seconds later, Vala, or the mum I guess, emerges from the liquid, transformed into this giant, saggy, titted abomination. Say what? And guys, this thing right here is your end boss. All of the hard work and perseverance has led to this. A giant naked monster created by a man suffering from a severe case of the Oedipus complex. And if this isn't supposed to be a huge reference to Peter Jackson's brain dead, then I don't know what's real anymore. For this final fight, you are given a minigun, though that's actually not as good as it sounds. The minigun takes a second or so to spin up and then it overheats within another two or three, during which all you can do is just kind of wait for it to cool down. The fight itself is just running around in a circle in this small environment, reacting to the different attack patterns and shooting the mum in the head. I mean, you'd think those giant milkers would be a weak spot, but they went for a much more simpler strategy instead. She throws barrels, piles of concrete, she tries to stomp on you, but it's not all that hard for a final boss, and once you put her out to pasture, the game is over. But we're still not done, son, because Clement shows up stricken with guilt, and then he says he wants to climb back inside his mother's womb and allow G and Isaac to then blow him up. Yeah, I'm not kidding. Clement crawls back up inside his giant mutated mother's lady parts. And I mean, Isaac's reaction pretty much sums up my reaction too. And I kind of feel like Vala almost foreshadowed this with a bit of dialogue that came earlier in the game. You see, my birth was celebrated. Whereas on your arrival, yeah, I'm sure. I bet. They tried to push you back in. It's a fitting end though for a game which hasn't taken itself seriously for a single moment. And somehow the sight of Isaac and G sitting in a chopper with Vala's still alive brain seems like the best possible outcome we could have had. 
We're far from done though, and after completing the main story, you then unlock the director's cut, which is like a harder alternate version of the main story, which also resets all of your weapon progress. And there's also three other game modes you can mess around in if you're so inclined. Now, I feel like it could be really easy to pick this thing apart if you really wanted to, but one of the main things that stuck out to me was something that's not even that big, and that's that there was no option to restart a level from the pause menu. I mean, if you screwed up early on and wanted to restart, you have to quit all the way back to the main menu and then load the chapter in again up from scratch. The other thing that I don't think really works that well is the combo system. The way it works is that for every enemy you kill without missing a shot, you earn a combo point, and then when you reach six kills like this, you go up to the next rank. Once this thing is maxed out, you're in Gorgasm mode, and earning a thousand points per kill compared to a hundred on the base level. But as soon as you miss a single shot, the combo resets and you're all the way back to the bottom. Shit, man. And I just don't think this combo system works in a game where you don't control the camera. It'd be fine in a game like Time Crisis where you're mostly locked down in one position. But in House of the Dead, you're able to shoot at things at all times, and often the camera is just going to randomly spin to the side or do a sudden 180. I mean, even when it's centered on a group of zombies, it's often just going to shift around entirely. You'd think that when the camera's locked down on a bunch of them, that it's going to wait until you've killed all of them before it moves on. But sometimes, it's going to move on even when there's a few left. Shit, man. It's also really only possible using single shot weapons. I mean, using weapons like the submachine gun, you fire so quickly that you're bound to miss more easily. Off the back of that too, I do kind of feel like being good at this game is more about just having the best possible guns and upgrading them, and I doubt it's even possible to get through this thing with one of the base weapons. Visually too, it's kind of all over the shop. I mean, let's not mince words, this ain't a very good looking game. Though it is stylistic and it does capture the tone it's going for, it is kind of ironic that despite being one of the later games in the series, it often looks like one of the worst. Just kind of lacks clarity and those film grain and damage effects sure aren't helping either. I mean, it is a Wii game in essence, so it is kind of hard to knock it for that, but just don't go expecting cutting edge visuals. Playing it on the PC with this Typing of the Dead version, you can still play through it with the original rail shooting controls, which honestly is the only way to do it. Because that typing mode is just downright soul crushing. But the PC edition doesn't even really look all that much better than the console version. It's got a high resolution supposedly, but even then it's not a huge difference. Another thing that I noticed was that on the PC version, the guns and the upgrades are a lot cheaper. I mean, the auto shotgun was $15,000 on the PlayStation 3 version, but here on the PC one, it's only $6,500. This though is a change I can get behind, because it was so grindy trying to unlock all of this stuff on the consoles. So if playing this on the PC is the only way you've got to play this thing, well, it's not the worst way to do it, and if nothing else, it sure is accessible. But it's otherwise a pretty half-assed port, I mean you can't even remap the controls for instance. Which is kind of annoying because swapping weapons is mapped to scrolling the mouse wheel. And you know what happens half the time? Yeah, you over-scroll and just scroll right back to the same weapon. Also, like the console version, there's no option to restart the levels from the menu. You've still got to do all that malarkey of exiting back out to the level select screen. I do think this is one of those times though where the tone and humour of something makes up for the game's shortcomings. And I'm kind of torn between whether or not I appreciate this more intentional humor, or the unintentional humor from House of the Dead 2, which still has the honor of having some of the most atrocious and hilarious voice acting in any video game, just unintentionally. To protect the life cycle. The only regret that I had from playing House of the Dead Overkill was that I hadn't played it sooner, and also that I'd never be able to play it again for the first time and be introduced to Isaac Washington, that absolute force of nature. Move aside, diaper shit. And if it taught me nothing else, it's that we need more games out there that have our main characters threatening to rip someone's balls off. Riding into the night, a trail of carnage, mayhem, and devastation behind them. Driven by a single desire, revenge. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>